Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for the penultimate Crown Seminar of the academic year. My name is David Patel, the Associate Director for Research at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. And on behalf of the, uh, all the faculty, staff, and students of the Crown Center, we welcome you here. Today, we're going to listen to Adria Lawrence. Adria Lawrence is the Aronson Associate Professor of International Studies and Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. And I'll post her full bio in the chat. She'll speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And then Alex Boudrukas, who's the discussant, is the Harold Grinspoon Junior Research Fellow at the Crown Center. Again, I'll post his bio in the chat uh, when he begins speaking. He'll provide quest uh, discussion questions, comments, things to get our larger conversation going for about seven to 10 minutes. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers. We have until 12.15 today, so that leaves plenty of time for all of you to ask your questions. I encourage you to ask your questions via the Q&A button, which is down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you don't see it, just hover your cursor over the bottom and it'll pop up. We also have a chat and the chat room will be open, but the panelists will not be monitoring it. Crown Center staff will, but again, if you have questions for the speakers, please ask it via the Q&A button, not via the chat. And during the Q&A session, I'll select the, the questions that I think are uh, most likely to drive the conversation discussion forward to, to ask. Uh, today's session is being recorded. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Adria and uh, please join me in welcoming her. Thanks so much, David. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm just gonna start by sharing my screen here. Um, See if I can get that going. Great, can you guys see that? Terrific, thanks. I'm delighted to be here to talk with you all today. Um, in early 1830, King Charles X of France, facing the threat of overthrow in France, sent an army of 37,000 to Algeria in the hopes that a military victory would help him navigate what was an increasingly precarious domestic situation. The army took Algiers, but the king, the last of the Bourbons, fell anyway in the July 1830 revolution. Though the reason for the conquest was gone, France would remain in Algeria for the next 130 years. The conquest of Algeria was the start of a new era in Africa and the Middle East, the start of a new European area and era in Africa and the Middle East. From Algeria, France would expand into Tunisia and then Morocco. And France and England would also begin the scramble for Africa towards the end of the century. Because France would stay for so long in Algeria, indeed, it was France's jewel in the crown like India was for Britain. Um, it provides a good opportunity to think about how colonial rule worked. What did France do in Algeria? Specifically, what kinds of strategies were employed to gain the compliance of Algeria's Berber and Arab populations? What was the French approach? And how is colonial rule different from other kinds of rule anyway? These are the questions that I'm taking up in a book that I'm working on that's currently entitled Colonial State Formation, Violence and Authoritarian Control in the Late Imperial Period. Now you might wonder why revisit the colonial period? What uses it to look at how colonial rule operated? I got interested in these questions from reading the growing body of scholarship that considers the legacies of colonialism. Interesting colonial legacies has surged, you know, driven by the desire to understand contemporary conditions in the post-colonial world. There are now many studies that have linked different types of colonial rule to various long-term issues like underdevelopment, um, civil war, or regime type. And those studies focus on the consequences of colonialism, but less is known about why colonial approaches varied to begin with. So today I'm going to draw on some of my studies of Algeria to discuss some common assumptions about what shaped colonial policy and how what it entailed. I'm going to challenge four claims about colonial rule and suggest that they're actually myths and I really look forward to discussing um, and debating these with you. So let me start with my first myth. When we talk about colonial rule, we think of particular kinds of strategies that seem to be characteristic of it divide and rule tactics, for instance, or direct and indirect rule. These seem to be associated with empire. We don't usually talk about nation states engaging in an indirect rule. So scholars have suggested that the colonies varied in how directly they were ruled. 
So maybe direct and indirect rule is what makes colonial rule colonial. This is a picture of Lord Lugard who literally wrote the book on indirect rule in um, the book he wrote, The Dual Mandate in British Tropical Africa. The logic of indirect rule was to preserve existing institutions, not to bring in European institutions or leaders, but to make use of what was already in the country, in the colony. It, this logic was a preservationist logic to sort of preserve what existed. And it had the upside of potentially being a cheaper way for the Europeans to dominate um, their colonies. In contrast, direct rule meant importing European institutions. And it entailed a transformative logic that justified colonialism as a civilizing project. The conquering state provided the model to be emulated. European bureaucracies and laws and modes of economic exchange would be transplanted to the colonies and European rulers would replace indigenous rulers. The French often exemplify this approach. And here you can see Lady Marianne bringing French civilization to Africa. French colonial rule overall tends to be considered to be more direct than British colonial rule because France had a civilizing mission and it aimed to assimilate its colonies. <clears throat> now, if any case should be easily classifiable as direct rule, it should be Algeria, France's most important colony. There was a very high level of French intervention in Algeria. And in 1848, the three divisions in Algeria of Constantine, Algiers, and Bonne were um, designated French departments. And departments are like states in the United States. It's the basic subnational unit in France. When I started on this project, I did not think that the claim that colonial powers chose between direct or indirect rule was controversial at all. You know, at the outset, my original plan was to ask why some places were ruled more directly than others. And I picked Algeria because I wanted to understand direct rule and see how it worked. So, you know, why am I now calling this a myth? What I found is that Algeria is not really easily classifiable using this terminology. You know, to go even a step further, it's not actually a case that where there really is a lot of direct rule. Uh, there wasn't a single strategy that the French took there. Instead, their approach varied over time and it varied in different places. And I found that even you know, for the first half century and even beyond, there was actually a lot of what looks like indirect rule. In the top right there, you'll see um, the Algerian leader, Abdel Qader. Now, the French, when they arrived, concluded several different treaties with Abdel Qader during the beginning of the, those early 1830s. And one, um, one general ceded about two thirds of Algeria to Abdel Qader in a treaty um, and then sort of treated him like a, a diplomat, you know, like, like he treated the French as if they were on a diplomatic mission to the territory controlled by Abdel Qader. Um, then General Bougeaud arrived and started a total war and he eventually defeated Abdel Qader in 1847. The bottom right picture shows um, a picture of the, the Bureau Arab, the Arab bureaus that the military set up. These bureaus involved military officers who were supposed to speak the language and work with local leaders. Um, the Bureau Arab, the, the, the ideology behind it was a preservationist logic. We're gonna try not to disrupt what, what is here in Algeria and work with the local leaders. And the bigger picture on the left here is a mejlis or a tribunal um, that was run by uh, Algerians at the time. So the French left in place some existing institutions, Quranic schools, um, the justice system, and there were debates that ensued among the French about how much to change. The rule, what rule looked like in colonial Algeria depended on where you were. So coastal cities like Algiers were governed differently from other parts of Algeria and French control extended over time. Algeria changed a lot over the course of the 130 years. It was not one type. Up until about 1870, most of the country was run by the military who advocated working with local leaders. But then after 1870, civilian authorities and settlers began to take control from the military and, and territories transferred from military to civilian control. Civilians tended to work less with intermediaries. So in that sense, it seems like civilian rule might be more direct. But the transformative logic of direct rule was never applied in Algeria 
France didn't bring its institutions to Algeria in any real meaningful sense. It did not replicate anything that looked like France's government in Algeria. French Algeria was nothing like France. French laws and institutions, when they were imported, were only imported for the French settlers. So it wasn't a strategy for ruling the colony. So let me just go back over some problems with this first myth. You know, Algeria should have been an easy case to classify, but it's not. And it's not alone. Cases can't really be easily sorted into types or placed along a continuum. So why can't they be? One reason is that there's a lot of variation subnationally across space. And uh, Mahmoud Mamdani has suggested that, you know, er there's an urban rural distinction that maybe is more meaningful than an indirect and direct distinction. Cases also varied over time as colonial strategies evolved and changed. And then also, if we think about the ideal cases, if we think about the concept of direct rule and indirect rule, which I discuss a lot in, in one of the, my working papers, um, if Algeria doesn't fit into this classification, if it's not a case of direct rule, then what would be a good case of direct rule? The ideal case of direct rule would be one where Europeans actually brought their own institutions and transformed a colony in their own image for the benefit of indigenous actors. I can't, we don't really have cases that look like that. We have the cases where the Europeans brought their own institutions for their own use and where they wiped out the indigenous population. But we don't have it as a strategy for ruling over colonies that had a significant population in them. The ideal indirect rule case, if we look at the flip side of that, would probably look more like an alliance. You know, if you really want to preserve um, local institutions and local leaders, then you probably don't have colonialism at all. You have an alliance. But moving forward, it'd be something more like um, yeah, strong ties or informal empire. Um, so that's not the case after the scramble of, for Africa. And when we're looking at Africa in the late imperial period, then we're kind of looking at a really narrow range of variation. If we look at directness, we're only exploring things that are not quite on the one extreme of indirect rule and not quite um, direct rule either. They're sort of in the middle there. Let me look at my second myth here. The dominant view among scholars who have studied these colonial legacies is that colonial institutions were designed to reflect the environmental and social and political conditions that the colonizers found when they arrived in their colonies. So Europeans implemented different approaches depending on the context. According to this logic, the setting is a constraint. And there's almost an experimental way that the French and the British talked about their colonies. And maybe that's why colonial settings have become so appealing for political economists who are looking to isolate causal factors. Existing accounts treat colonial officials as pragmatic technocrats who are responding dispassionately to the facts on the ground. They evaluate the setting and apply the right policy. To take a prominent example of this logic, um, in an article in World Politics, John Gehring and his co-authors argued that where there were state-like structures that were already in place, the Europeans chose to use them and implemented indirect rule. And in places that lacked social organization and leadership and institutions that could be co-opted, they had to rule directly. Now, um, in a paper that I, I've written with Fahad Sajid, who's uh, my brilliant co-author and is, who is about to defend his dissertation on colonial rule in India at the University of Chicago, we argue that this focus on the pre-colonial period is mistaken for two reasons. First, the colonial powers simply did not know enough about their territories at the outset of the colonial rule to formulate policy that reflected the setting. You know, the French, when they arrived in Algeria in 1830, they didn't really know very much. They were not able to correctly assess local conditions. In our paper, Fahad and I focus on colonial land policy and how that got decided. French officials in Algeria did not agree on the pre-colonial conditions that pertain to land. For instance, they couldn't agree on how fertile the Algerian plains were or how they compared to the plains in France. Um, they couldn't agree on what existing land tenure arrangements were. Were there pre-existing property rights and what were they? The French launched commissions to study the matter, but they couldn't reach agreement on what Algeria was like. 
Now you might think that the British in India were more well-informed, but as Fahad shows, similar debates about the pre-colonial setting occurred as Great Britain established formal colonial rule in India. Second reason why the setting didn't determine policy. Arguments that see continuity from the pre-colonial period to the colonial one have trouble addressing why colonial powers change strategy over time, why they tried things and then reversed them, um, why they created different institutions in different places. So Fahad and I argue that what's missing is an understanding of the politics of the colonial state, the political disagreements that shaped colonial policy. That brings me to the third myth. We tend to think about what the French or the British did in a colony as if there's two sides. So there's the French and then the Algerians. But as these disagreements over the pre-colonial setting suggest, colonial officials were not united. We can't really speak meaningfully about the French or the British or what the French did because colonial agents had considerable autonomy of action and they disagreed with one another about what to do. So in our paper, Fahad and I show that the colonial state was politically divided. Policy for Algeria wasn't set in Paris and then carried out by France's agents in Algeria, nor was it dictated by the pre-colonial characteristics that they found in Algeria when they got there. There were politics involved in colonial governance. Different metropolitan actors in the colonies had competing ideas about how best to rule over their conquered populations, and they argued in favor of different courses of action. Um, they disagreed, you know, on the setting in part because they brought with them a certain way of understanding. Um, they brought their own politics and their own ideas about good governance with them from France. Within the bureaucracy, there was a lot about, of disagreement. And for Algeria, I didn't find that there was an overarching strategy. There were multiple strategies. The colonial state in Algeria was divided between the metropole and the colony and between settlers and civilians and the military. And all of those actors had different ideas about how to run the colony. So Algeria, as I said, was divided into civilian run and military run zones. And here you see two pictures that in the top right is the Bureau Arab again. So the military empowered local actors. They worked with chiefs in these areas under military control. Now the civilians mimicked French institutions, but they were distorted because they had special laws for managing indigenous Algerians. They, um, civilians and settlers vehemently disagreed with one another about the right approach. And the settlers accused the military of siding too much with the Arab population. Um, and the, the um, military accused settlers of being too feudal. For the first 50 years, of colonial rule in Algeria, power shifted between the settlers and civilians and the military as governments fell in France and as policy in Algeria changed. So why is it important to challenge this unitary actor assumption? Well, we suggest is that if we wanna understand how colonial rule operated, we need to look at the divisions within the state because those divisions can help us understand why you got certain colonial policies in certain places and times. Let me get to my um, last myth here. And that is that in the post-conquest period, order replaced violin, violence. The French and a lot of other um, historians have drawn a sort of sharp line between the conquest period and the colonial period, with the period of conquest being characterized by the use of violence and the other being largely characterized by order. So the most violent phases of colonial rule appear to be the period of conquest and sometimes decolonization if there's a war of liberation as there was in Algeria. The violence of the conquest was not something that the French felt they needed to hide. On the contrary, King Louis the Philippe commissioned, Louis Philippe commissioned a series of portraits of the battles of conquest, including this one that you see here, for display at Versailles to sort of show off the, the accomplishments of the French military. What about after the conquest? What role did violence play? So if I'm suggesting that direct and indirect rule are not a good way to think about what colonial rule was like, then how should we think about colonial rule and colonial strategy? 
In the book manuscript, I argue for thinking about violence and the threat of violence as a systematic part of colonial rule and not an aberration as the French frequently portrayed it in their reports and writings. They portrayed post-conquest violence as a sort of temporary expedient or as something that an unfortunate incidence that happened out of the colonial powers control um, as something that erupted unbidden as a consequence of delegating to locals. In their reporting, any violence that occurred after the conquest um, was done and was completed was cast as a sort of unfortunate side effect of the more benign overarching colonial project. It certainly wasn't the explicit strategy. And any violence you know, could arise because the French considered Arabs to be violent. So the violence was on them. It came out of the society, not part of French strategy. But state violence was frequent enough to warrant consideration as a potentially consequential and systematic aspect of colonial state formation. Now, colonial state violence is very hard to study and it's largely been left out of this literature on legacies. In part, that's because the colonial authorities left it out. You know, they never said we pursued strategies of collective punishment or we used torture. But we shouldn't mistake colonial rhetoric for colonial acts. In fact, colonial rule in Algeria, uh, in Algeria and also elsewhere, not just in Algeria, involved a set of violent practices. So in this project, I borrow from two literatures one is on rebel orders and the other is on authoritarian regimes to identify a set of coercive practices that were employed by the colonial state. So what were some of those practices? Um, the French used violence either directly or through their agents to put down activity that was deemed rebellious. Um, but they acted as if this was unusual, even though punishment and rebellion were quite common. So here's a statement from the resident general in 1864, so post the conquest of Algeria. Um, and he's in that he justifies a recent use of repression, writing that some tribes led astray by the treacherous advice of a few ambitious men have listened to the spirit of evil and revolt. So here he implies, you know, it's just some tribes, some recalcitrant tribes, but most everybody else is happy with what we're doing here. Now, one reason why the military found it useful to work with local Kayads was that any violence that those Kayads employed could be chalked up to local tradition, even if it was violence that the French themselves were calling upon them to use. So Kayads could engage in arbitrary or collective punishment, and then the French were less directly responsible. So in this sense, indirect rule in Algeria was, as Karuna Mantena put it, a kind of alibi of empire. The French used the language of indirect rule in order to be able to designate to some of these Kayads and then be able to say, well, that was the, the, those people carrying out the violence. It had nothing to do with the colonial project. Using Mamdani's term, we could say that delegation to chiefs allowed for decentralized despotism. Chiefs used coercive means, and then they had the backing of their alliance with the French to tax the population or to force them to contribute labor to tasks. In areas ruled by the civilian government and the settlers, violence was arguably more routinized. The colonial state put in place um, the indigenat, which was special penalties for Algerians that were not crimes in France. They were only crimes if committed by Algerians in Algeria. So it wasn't a copy of French institutions that was created in these settler areas of Algeria. It was something new. It was you know, the installation of an autocratic regime. Let me just conclude here by putting back up those the four claims that I talked about um, and that I've called into question and labeled myths. And by way of concluding, let me just say that I think we benefit a lot by situating the study of colonial rule in Algeria and Africa within the study of autocracy more general. The colonial period is often treated as exceptional. You know, we may control for it in our regressions or start at independence. Um, and terms like indirect rule and direct rule make it seem as though the French were doing something different than other authoritarian rulers. These terms also sound technical and neutral, but they are in some senses alibis for regimes that employed coercive practices to enforce compliance. We have to look past what the French said they were doing to what they were actually doing. And when we do that, the colonial period resembles 
other autocratic forms of rule more than political scientists have recognized. I think we can learn a lot about the varieties of authoritarian rule by looking more at the colonial period and not treating it as a precursor to a more political period. The colonial state was political and thinking about the standpoint of different actors within the colonial bureaucracy can help us account both for the strategies they used and for the claims they made about what it was that they were doing. Thanks a lot. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Adriel. What, one of the things I really like about this project is you're, you're, dis, you're a political scientist by training, but clearly you're speaking across numerous disciplinary boundaries. Uh, and uh, to provide comments along those lines, we have Alex Budrukas, who's a, who's a historian, a, a postdoc at the Crown Center, who also speaks across disciplinary boundaries, uh, whether he likes to or not. So uh, Alex, uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, well, first of all, uh... Thank you very much uh, for this kind of great talk and paper. Uh, it's been it's been really nice to think through these questions with someone in a, in a different discipline. Um, and so, uh, yeah, to get started, I, I guess first of all, I really appreciated the you know, the attention to detail and nuance. You know, these arguments about uh, the the importance of different kinds of intermediaries who are have, you know different powers, different interests, acting across different scales. That kind of makes it difficult to boil down colonial rule into any of these kind of dichotomies or kind of broad structures um, uh, that are used kind of across, uh, that can be used or are kind of too often used across broad contexts and spaces. Um, and also this, this emphasis on the politics of imperial rule, rule and the importance of kind of digging into those details. Um, uh, and, and of course the role of opposition, which um, I mean, you had more time in your paper to talk about this than you did here, but um, uh, the role of uh, uh, not of these high level officials in imperial rule, which given your, your previous work, you know, makes sense that you'd write about this. Um, uh, but I, I very much appreciate it. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll break down my response into kind of three big questions. Um, and most of them are kind of questions for you to, to basically uh, talk more about, right? I'm kind of just hoping to, to hear a bit more about the project and your arguments. Um, and also as I put these together, I've, I've kind of realized a lot of them have to do with kind of coming from a different disciplinary perspective. So um, uh, uh, so well, I apologize in advance if there's something here that's obvious to a political scientist, but I hope that uh, you know, this will you know, let us uh, talk to each other a bit more directly. Um, so first, um, my first kind of broad question is about this uh, direct and indirect rule question. So I, I appreciate your kind of critique of this myth that we can really you know, boil down forms of imperial rule to one of these um, to one of these two two forms of rule um, and that you know you look in a, a, a situation like Algeria or really anywhere you're going to find various factions within imperial uh, within imperial circles who have different interests who are governing differently and thinking differently about things um, my question is uh, one is maybe are these arguments about direct and indirect rule maybe do less to how, in, how rule actually functioned than how it was legitimated? Like what if we turn the lens to the question of legitimation? So in other words, all right, oftentimes um, when, when imperial officials are, um, uh, are discussing uh, these kind of local rulers or local chiefs, quote unquote, right? This is often a discussion made in terms uh, of tradition. So even though most of these traditions are invented and, and, and all of these colonial states are forging something new, um, this is, uh, these, these debates are based on um, these, these recourses, whether it's to religion or to tradition or oftentimes to race, right? Um, about the supposed non-reformability or the you know, disinterest in building anything new. Um, whereas a lot of these kind of civilizing mission discourses are often more, uh, are backed by this idea of, of, of improvement or, um, or other things. So in, the, I mean, citing Mamdani, right, in the African context, he's writing, he's really writing about this period from the 20s and 30s when uh, indirect rule is is being focused, but uh, is being kind of the the focus of a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, colonial powers in Africa. Um, but of course, these 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 methods kind of change in the 40s and 50s and 60s as anti-colonial movements grow. Um, uh, and um, so so these these changing circumstances change how these legitimate legitimizations work. Um, 
So, I, I mean, this is an argument that's been made, you know, by, by other historians, Fred Cooper, historians of empire. Um, so it's not my argument, but maybe um, uh, the question of uh, the, the forms of legitimation and imperial rule and how these change across time. Um, my second kind of big question. Um, uh, so what's, what was funny about some of those dichotomies is I, I encounter them less in the historical discipline. Um, I guess historians have started to move a bit away from um, dividing direct rule and indirect rule, or even of typologizing, right? As historians are trained not to typologize, we're trained that, you know, not just the devils and the details, but the, all the interesting stuff is kind of in the details, right? There's, there's kind of a different focus of, of work. Um, so when, when, when I read about Al Algeria, it's usually related to forms of settler colonialism, right? Um, uh, and particularly in the early, early time, well, throughout the entire period, right? Um, and so instead of a focus on, uh, th there's not, not as much of a focus on institutions in more recent historical st scholarship, but on the production of subjectivities, right? The, the, the dichotomy between colonizer and colonized, conceptions of citizenship and subjecthood, who gets it, what does it mean? How does this relate to conceptions of citizenship and, set, and subjecthood in the metropole? Um, and, and particularly, uh, particularly the category of race, right? And, and, and how this um, uh, really becomes ever further reified um, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so I guess my, my question is one, if we're going to talk about uh, Algeria in particular, how does the Algerian experience and particularly the experience of settler colonialism as it took shape in Algeria, wh what makes Algeria different and, and what makes it comparable to other imperial, uh, imperial stories? And I mean, you do a good job, job of talking about how it's kind of this remarkable case. Um, so maybe um, what are the potentialities and also the dangers of extrapolating from Algeria? Um, so that might be, uh, that's kind of my second broad question um, and the question of settler colonialism. Um, and then thirdly, um, this is more, this, th this is me trying to draw out kind of your inter intervention. Um, this is also kind of a disciplinary question, um, but to try and get a sense more of, of who you're writing against, right? So I think part of this is not being a political scientist. I don't know the literatures you're intervening in nearly as well. So this, this might be part of it. Um, so as a social historian, uh, listening to this and reading your work, I found myself very much kind of nodding my head in agreement, you know, the importance of how things happen on the ground and how they're different from they're portrayed by, how they're portrayed by imperial officials or uh, the challenging of categories, kind of digging into these quotidian details and finding kind of the, the fractures in, uh, within colonial administration, within conceptions of empire, the kind of contradictions and other things. Um, but also as a social historian, right, these are very much kind of fundamental tenets of the field of social history, right? Kind of dating back to the 1960s. This has been very much kind of the project of, I think, social historians writ large, um, right? You know, contingency and agency and nuance, you know, the importance of resistance, of bottom-up social movements. Um, and and you know, you've written about this, of course, um, in your, your work, uh, in your other work. Um, so uh, I, I was wondering, uh, one, who specific, who, who you really want this uh, kind of critique to engage with, right? Which scholars are you particularly taking issue with? And also, right, the question of violence is also something that has um, a long history in, in, in scholarship on colonialism, right? Going back to Fanon or Walter Rodney, right? Back to the people who are writing histories of colonialism while fighting colonialism, right? Um, it's, it's, it's kind of this, this, long, uh, this long and kind of proud tradition in anti-colonial thinking. Um, so, how are you bringing these scholars, these 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 anti-colonial scholars who 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 talk about violence, kind of in, into conversation with fields? Because I get this hint, and I'm not sure if I'm if I'm totally missing the point here, but uh, that you have that you're taking issue with these kind of macro level studies of colonial rule, right? These and you say these 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 n number large n studies, right? Of of how we have of quantification to try and understand rule. Is, is this kind of a disciplinary intervention uh, in, in a way, right? A way of saying, uh, you know, we should be studying and writing about, uh, about empire and about colonial rule differently. And then maybe to get, uh, it would be helpful to get kind of a better sense of, of what these particular scholars uh, are arguing, kind of who you're writing against. I think that would be, um, especially someone in, in another discipline that would be helpful. Um, so those are my three kind of broad questions. And again, I, I very much enjoyed the talk and really appreciated your, your not just willingness, but like enthusiasm to get into these, 
these like quotidian details, which I agree are completely essential to understanding what's going on. It's fantastic, Alex. Uh, Adrian, how about I just give you a, a, a few minutes to pick up any of the threads that Alex put on the table? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Alex, thanks so much. I really appreciate those comments. And I think some of them are things that I'm still sort of wrestling with, like how do I wanna put, you know, who do I wanna make this project for and which debates do I wanna address? And there's some that I think, just maybe going backwards in your comments here, um, that I think um, are clearer than others, you know? And I think that's still because I'm a little on the fence about what I wanna say, for example, to historians. So I will say that I, I'm always glad to hear that historians think I'm not getting something wrong about like my story or that I'm so hearing that I'm like fitting in and not saying something that historians would find too controversial is a good thing for me because it means I haven't made a mistake and I think sometimes political scientists um, are accused of having sort of a thin understanding of history. Um, and I think that does come from some of our very different goals. So when you ask who I'm writing against part of it is this legacies literature. And, and that I'm trying to make some negative arguments against, that they use classifications, French versus British. They might use direct versus indirect. They might even use like settler versus non-settler, something that can be easily coded. And what I'm saying is that we have to understand what did that mean for actual governance and rule? Like if we wanna understand the long-term trajectories, we have to know what made settler rule different from non-settler rule or what made indirect rule different from direct rule. Otherwise we don't really know what those studies are capturing. Um, at the same time, though, I'm trying to occupy a middle ground, right? In political science, we don't actually like, if sometimes I get students who tell me I'm adding more nuance and I'm like, we don't care about nuance, right? We don't, we don't like nuance for nuance's sake because what we're trying to do is find the thing that helps us systematically explain what happened, like where we got to, why did we get this policy in um, the military ruled areas and this other policy in the civilian areas. So I'm trying to navigate that spot in the middle where you know maybe it's a Goldilocks spot where you add in um, just enough nuance or detail to orders in order to say these people's explanation has to be wrong. And we should look at this other set of, um, of explanations in order to understand the legacies. Um, in terms of typologies, I will tell you that the very first time I got started with this project, um, a historian, Emmanuel Sada, I think at Columbia, um, asked me when I said I was going to study variation in direct and indirect rule, where are you going to find a case of direct rule? And um, I said, well, Algeria, which is her area of expertise. And she was like, there's no direct rule in Algeria, which was shocking to me and sort of kicked me off on this project. So yeah, historians have moved away from typologies. Whilst political scientists need to be able to put, the, put, put countries and cases into types in order to understand these differences between them and what makes them different and what makes them comparable. Um, and so I think as I've moved through this project, I too have moved away from the typology from a sort of focus on typologies to a focus on practices. But the key question is then how do I translate those practices into explanation? But I, I will say where I'm trying to do something that I think is different from some of the historical work I've looked at. One is to find comparisons. So some people have suggested to me that Algeria is really unique. Maybe Algeria is more violent because it was a settler colony in which the indigenous population survived and was not wiped out like or reduced in greatly in numbers like in other settler colonies. Um, but what I've found so far from looking at other people's historical work like Gregory Mann is that these kinds of everyday violence occurred in other parts of Africa as well. Um, and that there, this may be a kind of common mechanism that exists across other kinds of places. And I too have noted this sort of historical literature's move towards theorizing race and theorizing symbolic violence. And I think then for historians, in some ways, I seem more like an older generation of historians, like where I'm less interested in symbolic violence and more in this sort of actual everyday use of violence in order to suppress rebellion. Um, and maybe that's the same answer to your first question about like how, how did, I think there's a lot of good studies on how colonial rule was legitimated to and sold to metropolitan populations. And I think that literature is, is really terrific. Uh, 
um, and how that has changed over time. I guess what I'm trying to do is look at, uh, try to separate, separate out the question of how it was legitimated from what actually happened and call and say, those things aren't the same thing. I do see that sometimes the historical literature is more interested in the sort of metropolitan reception of colonial ideologies than in what took place in the colonies over time. I don't wanna, I could talk about these questions all day, but I definitely wanna leave some time for, for other people. These are, these are great things to think about, Alex. So a lot of the questions we have touch on touch on a lot of these issues, especially of violence. So we'll, we'll come back to them. Uh, first, though, on the on the point about nuance, I, I'd recommend everyone. Th there's an there's an article by a sociologist at Duke, Kieran Healy, uh, on nuance and the role of nuance in theorizing. And I I recommend that article. Not only does it have a memorable title, but it, it also speaks to a lot of these issues of of how how should we value nuance, especially from a social scientific perspective. Again, that's Kieran Healy at Duke. Um, so first, though, I'm going to I'm going to bring us to, to, to the contemporary period because there are a couple of questions that touch on this. So uh, uh, Professor Bellin from Brandeis says, uh, can you suggest what the legacies of this colonial experience had on the character of the Algerian regime in the post-colonial period? And similarly, uh, Dr. Haroun asked, uh, wanted to know about the involvement of the military rule in Algeria post Second World War. And I think both of them are getting at this uh, long-term legacies of colonialism. Um, yeah, so those are good questions because obviously it's, it's easier to make a negative argument and say, you guys are getting the wrong thing when you're looking at colonial legacies than it is to sort of replace it with something. And as I said, I think like trying to get a sort of quantifiable variable for violence is gonna be exceedingly difficult even for one country because of the informational problems of doing that. But I think that um, there's some existing very interesting work that suggests that, for example, that indirect rule has led to more um, autocracy, right? But the mechanism for how that would work is very difficult to, to understand because we don't know exactly what's happening in those um, cases that are coded as, as being more indirect than the other cases. Like, what does that actually look like? And I think like the, um, a focus on violence might be able to help, might help us understand some of the challenges that post-colonial countries have faced because we know from the civil war, war literature that places that experience violence are more likely to continue to experience violence later on. And so it could be that this sort of experience of violence um, has long-term effects both on the regime type and on the probability of civil war. Where I wanna go next is to try to think about these sort of practices of violence and how they might have different long-term consequences. So that if there's practices of sort of collective punishment that include like pushing people off their land, that's gonna have a different kind of consequence than the set of codes um, called the indigenat, which um, were, were used in settler areas and also in other parts of French Africa. So I think there's, I guess the short answer is that there's probably a lot more work that I'll still need to do and that others will need to do to consider the legacies. Um, I, I hope that this work has implications for that, though what I'm trying to do is get a handle on maybe like the, the input variable, like what did colonial rule look like and how did it vary across space? Great, so before we turn to some of those specific things, I mean, Richard Nielsen asked an interesting uh, a question related to this is, how might alternative understandings of colonial rule shape politics in Algeria and in France now and in the future? Alternative understandings of, um, yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Um, um, how does alternative understandings, I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm less interested in like how they understood it than in how they, uh, what they actually did. But I mean, obviously the way that people perceive the colonial period can matter uh, quite a lot. And I think we've seen across the post-colonial world, the tendency to sort of label what happened during the colonial period as responsible for the, the same way like Trump labeled anything bad that was going on after 2016 as Obama's fault. Like we, we tend to see the same thing happening. So the way that we depict colonial rule um, matters for relationships between the metropole and the state. And it also matters um, for the ways that people understand the reasons for continuing um, 
conditions in their own country. So those understandings do matter. And obviously Algeria and France have a very fraught history of trying to come to term to come to terms with the legacies of the period. I think one thing that might be interesting if I'm just focused on Algeria in that question is that um, those a lot of the focus is on the war on 1950 that starts at 1954. And I think it might be worthwhile to consider that the roots of that violence go back further than 1954. That there wasn't as suddenly a sharp rupture from a period in which you know Algerians weren't subjected to coercion or violence to one in which they were. Um, that th those things predate that. And that might help us to understand some of like why the war got underway the way that it did. Great, so let, let's dig down in some of the details. Uh, one question, and you can see them in the Q&A, uh, Adria, if, if I'm speaking too quickly, but uh, Ekram Karakoch, I, I hope I pronounced that correctly, asks uh, about French colonial regimes policies towards ethnic and religious groups or minorities in Algeria. In particular, can you say something about the colonial regime's policies towards uh, uh, Amizigs, uh, Berbers, Jews, and Christians, and when they were situated in forming, consolidating, and resisting the colonial rule? Yeah, sure. I'd be glad to talk a little bit about that. So um, I talk a bit about this in my book on anti-colonialism, which, you know, that um, there's a, a elite Algerian movement that seeks rights and seeks citizenship um, during the, the late 1800s and the early part of the 20th century. And ultimately they don't get it. The way that the French divide their reporting on Algeria and also on Morocco where I've done some work is that they tend to divide it up by religion. So they'll have like a section of like what's going on with the Jewish community, what's going on with the Muslims and um, what's happening in Kabyle. So um, there's been some excellent work on the sort of Kabyle myth and the sort of um, ways in which the Algerian, the French considered Kabyles to be different and perhaps more um, able to be civilized than the Arabs. Um, and this, this happens in other countries, other countries and other colonies with an Amazigh or a um, population of different sorts, that they have this sort of impression to begin with. Um, so the French have this impression of the Kabyles as potentially assimilable. And they do assimilate the Jewish population of Algeria um, and extends French citizenship to the Algerian Jews. And that creates potentially a divide between Algerian Jews and the rest of the population that was itself somewhat politically fraught. Um, what I think is interesting about the, 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 um, the Kabyles is that um, in 1871, following the like sort of 1870 um, end of the war in France, uh, there's a resurrection and, and there's an insurrection and in, um, not a resurrection that's that just happened uh, for for christians but you know, there's an insurrection in um Kabyle areas of algeria and um the french you know express a lot of shock at this because they have told themselves a story about the Kabyles and about their affinity for french rule and um what's interesting about that is that it's not that long after in great britain there had been a, a mutiny in india and um both the British and the um, French draw the opposite conclusions about what those rebellions meant. So the Kabyle insurrection causes a shift in strategy in colonial Algeria, away from this kind of indirect rule that the military said it was using and towards civilian control. So the settlers politicized the rebellion and the civilians to say, this shows us that the military approach failed and now we need to shift course. A similar process unfolds in Great Britain um, in regard to the mutiny in which the, um, the, the British say, this shows us that our policy had, has failed, but they take the opposite conclusion. And they say, this shows us that the, our policies of ruling more directly have failed and we need to move in the opposite direction. So rebellions and the ways that the French understood different groups shaped then, they, they could be seized upon as opportune moments for those actors to push forward their preferred um, agendas and actions. Fascinating. So we, we've had a couple questions about violence. Um, and so let me let me try to combine some of these. Asmel Gamal asks, uh, on your point on violence and the threat of violence being a sy systematic part of colonial rule, I'm wondering if you can comment on the distinctiveness of this characteristic to colonial context. To what extent does this feature also in does to what extent does this feature also define the contemporary politics of countries like Algeria or Egypt? 
And in that sense, to what extent does the feature make colonial rule distinctly colonial? That's a really great question. And that's a question that I've been asking my students and I would like to like put that out to the audience. You know, what do you think makes colonial rule distinctive like or, or colonial violence distinctive? Because the more that I read about how um, the French are governing in Algeria, the more I would say that I see these similarities between French rule and other autocracies. And I question why we take colonial rule out as something that's distinctive. I think that in part, the reason we do that is because what colonial rule has come to represent for all of us in our academic community, which is something that goes beyond the actual day-to-day -day management of the colony. Um, colonial rule is in many ways defined by these kinds of um, hierarchies, like racial hierarchies, inequalities. And so it's become a shorthand for us for these sort of forms of injustice. And that's why we use the term colonial to apply it to situations that you know are very different from the kind of situation um, the formal colonial situation, but which have these sorts of inequalities and um, built into them. Um, and so I think that there's a, there's a difference between the sort of political and rhetorical importance of the concept of the colonial as it's used in the academy today and in public writings and whether or not like the actual day-to-day -day experience of being in France, being in Algeria, under French rule was different. The one way I can think of that it is different might be that, um, could be that the French made a lot of mistakes because they lacked a lot of information about the territory. But the French also had a lot of resources. They had some resources. They, they may have had more resources than some post-colonial states. But I haven't been able to like identify like, okay, this is what makes colonial rule um, different. So I guess that that's the title of my talk revealed here that I'm, I actually want you guys to answer the title of the talk about what, what is distinctive about colonial rule. Well, there's, I, I don't know if it's an answer to the question, but there's two, there's a couple of things in the Q and A that I'll raise that I think speak to this. One is a uh, Jamil Hilal who wrote that uh, it's more of a comment. I noticed that little is said or studied about how the colonized viewed and responded uh, with what the colonists, colonialists did and behaved. The study of colonial rule should notice uh, what the ruled, those who were ruled thought, what they did and what they, how they behaved. And it should be a relational approach. Uh, but there are some provocative uh, quotes provided by Francis Giles. I apologize if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, but he gives us some quotes at the beginning from, to, from Tocqueville who described Algeria as a, uh, um, France without law and without hypocrisy in a report to parliament in 1846. And earlier the French governor general wrote in 1832, quote, the Arabs are vermin, which should be destroyed as the Americans are destroying the native Indians. And his question to you is French officials may not have understood the prior system, but are you arguing that their aims were not clear? Um, I'm not arguing that their aims were not necessarily clear because different different actors had, you know, very clear kinds of aims. And I guess I should say that, you know, one of the puzzles about like, what does France do in Algeria arrives from the sort of timing of the beginning of the conquest of Algeria, which is sort of in between two periods of imperialism. By 1830, the, um, you know, legal slavery was, was on its way out. It was going to be ended. So enslaving the population was no longer sort of something that was considered as a possible way to deal with the indigenous Algerians there. However, like as this person um, noted in their question, um, the idea of sort of ethnic, what we would call ethnic cleansing was debated. And the fact that the way that the um, Europeans settled the Americas the, as a potential approach was also debated. So there were discussions about whether the Algerian population could be exterminated, whether they would sort of um, end up dying on their own. And many of them did. So in the first, I think, 40 years of out French rule, the population declined by a third due to displacement and famine caused by um, many, much of it caused by the colonial incursion. Um, but 
Tocqueville is part of this commission that's supposed to be studying Algerian and reporting back. And his report back is a political report about his aims and his ideas for Algeria, which are very, very different from his ideas about what makes America great, by the way. So it's an interesting contrast for those of you who are more familiar with Tocqueville's studies of America. Um, his ideas are based upon a kind of intent for France to um, take over the rest of Algeria. Because at the time he's doing his commission, France is still deciding, do we stay in Algeria or do we go? Like, And if we stay, do we stay along the coastal areas or do we engage in total war and take back the land that Abdel Qadr and other leaders control? So he has a political position. And that's what I'm trying to point to. It's not that the positions were unclear, it's that they were multiple and that there were other positions that vied for those positions and that those debates were very, very fierce. I think the comment about, you know, where do the colonizers fit into this is an excellent one. And it's one that we have the least access to, you know, but I think that we can infer it sometimes. We can infer that um, when our depiction of the colonizers just kind of coming in in this sort of all powerful way and pulling the strings and engaging in um, divide and conquer, they're not, because they lack the information that I talked about during the talk, because they don't know the setting that well, they're actually subject to manipulation. And there's like a trove of information that, that there's a trove of um, historical incidents that can, could potentially show that, but which we may not ever be able to access because we don't have the written side from the point of view of, of Algerian elites and Algerian leaders. But I think we can infer from looking into the details sometimes and reading between the lines that, you know, the Algerians were also actors too. And they were also trying to like vibe and play off these different French interests against one another in order to further the interests of themselves and their communities. So I, I, I think a related question to that, uh, we'll expand off to Morocco and ask for comparison in a second, but Jennifer Sessions uh, asks if you could elaborate on the idea that the French denied their own reliance on violence in Algeria. Uh, when both military and other forms of cultural and economic violence were discussed in great detail in both archival and public venues by military men, colonial administrators, settlers, and Algerians alike. So it, it touches on some of those uh, uh, earlier quotations, but this explicit denial of violence as, as, as a bedrock. That's um, great. I'm glad to hear that um, Jennifer Sessions is here because I'm a huge admirer of her book and I probably learned the most about this period from her book itself. So I'm not, I think the French were quite often extremely proud of certain forms of violence, but I think that there is, and I would be very interested to know if, if you think that that's inaccurate, that there's a shift between the period of conquest in which it's easier to sell violence back at home to um, the assembly and to domestic audiences because it's part of the war. And then when the war is completed, um, there's a little bit more of an effort to try to hide that. Now that depends of course on the actor. So sometimes it's the minister of war who's like, well, let's maybe not talk about um, this recent massacre while the general there is saying like, no, let's, let's be proud of it and let's put that forward. So um, I think there's a demand that that there's a sort of um, a kind of PR element that kicks in once the conquest is supposed to be over where it may look bad for the military um, or for the government in general, for the Ministry of War, if they have to keep saying, We're, we continue to see unrest because it undermines their, the fact that they're doing their job, that they're preventing rebellion. Um, I mean, that's a sort of looser characterization, but I think um, there certainly is some kinds of efforts made to sort of hide certain aspects of what's going on in Algeria or to keep it out of the press. So along those lines, uh, Keshav Bansal says that physical violence isn't the only kind of violence in the playbook of colonial rule. The other kind, epistemic violence, as uh, Spivak puts it, uh, that, that form of that epistemic violence continues. Do you think the latter is similar or different from the former uh, kind in general, and particularly in the case of French colonization of Algeria? I guess I would be curious to know what is exactly meant by epistemic violence. Do you, do you know that term well, David? No, I don't. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, um, 
I guess I think like, I mean, I'm not sure exactly epistemic violence or how it's different from symbolic violence or other kinds of forms, but um, yeah, physical violence isn't the only kind of violence. Um, there's also co coercion that rests on the kind of threat of physical violence, but isn't physical violence. My sense is that there's sort of a lot of attention to um, not like nonviolence, not physical violence in the literature today or in um, studies of it, that there's more of a sense on like um, this kinds of sort of symbolic violences or grievances or the ways in which people talked about um, the, the Arabs of Algeria in demeaning ways. And I guess like, I'm not saying that we can't study that, but I think that physical violence is very, very important to, to look at. Could I, could I jump in and ask a quick question as well? Um, kind of related to the concept of epistemic violence. Maybe if, if we're talking about how violence functions and how violence is justified across this period in Algeria, what about focus? Uh, what, what about this idea of focusing on the you know, processes of differentiation and dehumanization, right? These like rhetorical measures that are used in order to justify violence after the conquest period, right? That like there is still, you know, people are still being dispossessed, right? The state is literally killing people in many ways at this in this point in time. But um, but even if it's no longer war, right, or conquest that's justifying it, there's still a lot of violence happening. It's just happening because for other reasons and partly because of these, the, the production of these, you know, the, the figure of the Algerian against which you can use anything, right? Like, is that maybe one way of thinking about the um, kind of the continuities of violence through this period or um, kind of how we see, you know, the, the legacies of this, of this period kind of carrying on into the 20th century? I guess I think that, you know, there has been more, there's an, an academic interest in studying sort of the, um, the grievances of the Algerian population or the way in which the settlers, let's say, speak and spoke and wrote about and the French in their reporting. It's very difficult to sit down with a sort of report from Algeria or look at the archives without seeing the sort of racial undertones. I mean, those all come through. And I think from a standpoint of someone in, you know, 2021, 2020 reading those reports, it's easy to focus on the language. And I guess I think that maybe we tend to attribute too much importance to that than to the actual experience of things like being displaced off your land, um, being put in, you know, able to be arrested and put into prison for short periods of time period for really minor offenses or almost nothing at all. So in other words, I guess I wonder whether as academics we're not too preoccupied with those forms of violence, perhaps because they're more relatable to our own experience than the actual experience of physical violence or the threat of physical violence. So I'm gonna broaden out a little bit, uh, but staying within the French colonial framework, uh, Ashraf Idrissi uh, asks, when it comes to the second myth about adapting strategies, while the French colonists might not have known about pre-colonial Algeria, when it came to Morocco, they actually did adapt their strategies, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis women and religion. The French adapted their strategies based on their experience in Algeria. However, the end result was still violence and despotism. If the end result of colonial violence is the same, then how can we account for variations, which when taken comparatively between Algeria and Morocco still, still, eventual, still eventuate similarly? Um, I think one of the difficulties about um, having a certain set of information is that one of you know, so one of the things that the French wanted to do was they wanted to study these societies and document them and create commissions in order to be able to feel like they understood um, what was happening before they arrived and then could designate the appropriate strategies. And one problem with that can be an, a lack of information at the outset, so that they're relatively inexperienced in North Africa when they arrive in Algeria and can only draw upon like Napoleon's adventures in Egypt. So the same isn't true when they arrive in Morocco because they have their Algerian experience. What they don't have, either when they arrive in Algeria or when the French arrive in Morocco, is an understanding of what the political situation that they will be facing, given the fact that they have just been intervening. So you can study a society from afar and maybe get a sense of the local cleavages and stuff. What good is that going to do you when you actually arrive 
And then, but your own arrival is changing the alliances and changing the ways that people respond. So I think that's a sort of like fundamental problem and it persists even in um, discussions of foreign military intervention today. That if you can only get a handle on the sort of pre-intervention setting, you'll be better able to manage it because it, it, it acts as if there's no politics that's going to erupt from the intervention itself. So I think when, um, you know, when they arrive in Morocco, um, they have somewhat more information, but as you said, like that the information about Morocco doesn't necessarily help them because the arrival of the French changes the incentives for different actors, for those who are um, maybe opposed to the Sultan extending control, for those for the Sultan himself. So it alters the political calculation, which is why I think this kind of focus on the pre-colonial setting is 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 quite. Um, misguided. I do think like Morocco is, is really interesting to talk about because we tend to think of Morocco since the French kept the Sultan in place as indirect rule and the Algerians where there was, you know, total war for the first 17 years, um, where there was um, not a sort of indigenous leader, like they got rid of the Ottoman Bey in Algiers initially when they arrived as being very different types. But when we look at the sort of practices across place, they're, they're maybe not as different as they might seem to be. I just shared a link to your, your article on uh, first movers in Morocco. I think it's uh, related to some of the discussion we've been having here uh, indirectly, uh, pardon the pun. So this is a good time to ask Andrew March's question. Uh, uh, Professor March is a faculty lead fellow at the Crown Center this year. He says that when you talk about politics, quote unquote, on the French side, can you speak a bit more about who the exact parties were, what, their perce what they perceived as their interests or constituency, and what the source of their knowledge of Algeria was? Were they bureaucrats? Were they scholar politicians like uh, de Tocqueville? Yeah, so um, what they, you know, so the, there's, there's a lot of actors who are involved in the colonization of, of Algeria. There's also the, um, there's the people who are, there's a sort of cleavage, if I would speak about cleavages, there's cleavages between those who are in the colony and those who are back in Paris. And that's a very, you know, vibrant cleavage. So in our, to our mind, we might imagine that France is sort of controlling, since it's a centralized colony and it's supposed to be ruling in a more centralized manner, that the, um, the French foreign ministry would have more control or the French colonial ministry would have direct control, but they often didn't. And so some of the time you can think of it as sort of the colony versus the metropole. Um, and to take one example that I just love of that, you know, I talked about Abdul Qadr and how um, about, you know, a large portion of Algerian territory was ceded to him. What was interesting about that is that the territory that was ceded to him was ceded to him in a treaty that he signed with the resident general um, in Arabic. And then there was a French one that they sent back to the National Assembly, which just didn't mention that they had ceded. They, they omitted the paragraph where France cedes um, Algerian territory to Abdul Qadr's rule because they just think we can we cannot share that information. And how are they ever going to find out? And, you know, Leote does this in Morocco as well. They take autonomous acts that are explicitly against their orders. And so they have, you know, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but they have some autonomy of control in a sense that um, they should, they, that they know what they're doing as the man on the spot, maybe better than um, the politicians in Paris. Then within the, the two sides that I discussed the most in the paper would be the military, but the military also is not a monolith, but I sort of, but the military shares an interest. And one, are, one of those interests is that the military is best suited to running the colony of Algeria. So they want to keep some of their bureaucratic, I think, you know, right to, to rule and they're reluctant to turn it over to civilians and settlers. They're also charged with providing security for the colony. Um, on the other side, there's the sort of civilians and settlers. I, I haven't done a lot of work on um, so far on the backgrounds of different um, civilians and, and settlers. Some of the settlers are not coming from France at all. You know, many of them had no French background, um, but uh, many of them, you know, could be, Tocqueville probably isn't a typical representation, but um, um, a lot of them had, um, came from a, a more, um, Concern, the, uh, okay, I guess I would say that they overlap in some ways where the military seems to find favor under uh, 
under the mo monarchical institutions, whereas when there's a republic, they seem to favor the civilian and settlers more. But those are sort of the, the general cleavages, I guess. So although I see Richard Nielsen is, is no longer with us, uh, I, mean, well, I mean, figuratively, not literally, he's just not in the webinar anymore. But he asked an interesting question I'm gonna ask because I, I wanna know your, your take on it. He says he understands is that uh, France recently declassified some additional archives related to Algeria. And he's been hearing vigorous debate about these articles and archives on uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, what's your take on them? Um, you know, that just happened. So I don't quite have a take on them yet. I think they're, they're mostly to do with the war. Um, but I would love to get back and see them. I had some experiences in the, in the archives when I was doing um, work for my book project on the anti-colonial period in which you sometimes would ask for various archives in Algeria and be told that they were, you know, they were classified and you couldn't have them. Um, I remember at one point I asked if I could just see the list of the classified cartons so that I would not request them, but they told me the list was classified. And then I, I felt like that I was in a, you know, um, an inescapable uh, conundrum of trying to figure out which sources to get. I, I don't know that much about those yet though. I'll, I'll have to like look into that. I would love to get back and do some more archival research when we're able to travel again. And I, I want to. I'm going to ask a question just to push back on uh, some of the some of the praise that that Alex gave you. Um, you know, nuance and uh, uh, quotidian details are are, are are fun, but you can also make a good argument that the the world is a messy and confusing place, and messy and confusing answers don't help us understand it any better. Uh, some of your concerns, I, I feel like, are just a matter of. Uh, I don't want to say poor research, but when you say cases cannot easily be sorted into direct or indirect, or because they, they vary subnationally and cases vary over time, that just means the, the unit of analysis is wrong. The case isn't French Algeria. The case or unit of observation should be a, a district in a certain period of time, right? That could change. So you can think of some of this is just, you're saying people are doing research poorly. But my, my question is just bigger. What do we? What do you think we lose when we when we dive too much into the nuance, too much into the quotidian details, and uh, lose some of this ability to step back, extract uh, um, um, generalizations across time and place? Yeah, I mean, I think I we agree on that point. I mean, I think that you know we we don't want to get lost. In, in part, our job as social scientists is to cut through some of those details and nuance and be able to pull out the things that actually matter. And so I see myself as engaged in that, as coming through this from a political scientist. Like, what was important about colonial rule? You know, what was it that we might expect to have a long-term impact? I think we're much more likely to find the answers to that by looking at the kind of long-term effects of violence subnationally within the colonial state, even though that's very hard to do. It's very difficult to do. And I, you know, I'm only sort of on the route to trying to do that. Um, the, second, the, the second point that you made, the way that you started quite provocatively about, you know, isn't this just like a unit of analysis question? It's not really a unit of analysis question because we don't actually know when we go into these things what how we would code or what even is meant by indirect and direct rule. So right now, indirect and direct rule in, in large end studies is typically measured by a sort of proportion of customary cases to direct rule cases. What does that mean as it varies for what rule looks like? That's really unclear. So it's not just a sort of like, let's go down and look at this at the subnational level. Indirect and direct rule are, are, let's say, in experimental language, a basket of treatments that seem to go together. You know, they could be settler, non-settler. They could be um, uh, using intermediaries or not using intermediaries. It could be the kind of legal system. These aren't really one thing. So I think it's, it's I'm trying to make an argument. Yes, I, I did talk about how it doesn't explain these variations, but it's also like, it's a deeper critique than that. I think it's that, you know, this isn't, there isn't an underlying directness thing there that's actually a real variable or at least not a single variable. And we could disaggregate those things. We could look just at the justice system or we could look just at the quantity of settlers but putting them all together doesn't add up to a thing that's varying. And that's where I think like, 
you know, sometimes we can go too far in simplifying something so far that we've moved into explaining something that no longer really has a referent in the world. And I think when what, what we're trying to do in some of these studies that are especially looking at the long-term legacies of colonialism in Africa is that they're trying to like map them out as differences, but there's actually like very, very, they're using a lot of similar strategies in a lot of these different places. And so it's very hard to, to see if those are actually capturing something important that's telling us more about what we want to know about what those places are like today and how they got that way. Excellent. So in, in Jennifer Sessions provided some additional information in the reference to the archives. Uh, she, she says the French did not reopen archives. They'd closed off access to previously accessible materials and are now backtracking, which is a... Uh, uh, oh, great. <laughs> useful understanding. Uh, so this has been terrific. I, I think you... the. the uh, I love I love hearing about projects in 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 the works, right? That that we can provide feedback on, that can shape the direction of. And this is this is a project that truly I'm looking forward to to reading and seeing uh, seeing how it develops in the coming uh, in the coming months, uh, and hopefully not too many years. <laughs> uh, so I thank all of you for joining us. The next, and I thank also Alex for the terrific comments and interjections uh, and throughout. Uh, our final uh, Crown Center seminar for the academic year is on May 5th. That's again from 11 to 12, 15 p.m. And we'll be hearing from Puya Ali Magam on contesting the Iranian revolution, the green uprisings. And I provided a link in the chat for that. So uh, please again, join me in thanking uh, uh, Adria for, and Alex for joining us today. And I hope to see all of you on May 5th. In the meantime, please go get vaccinated. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks very Alex. much. It's great hearing more.